Hi, all of you at Choice School Thiruvala. Thank you for inviting me to be a part of your TEDx countdown event. A couple of years ago, I traveled to Northern India to a place overlooking the plains of Bangladesh where the Khasi people live in a forest that receives more rainfall than anywhere else on earth. And during the monsoon season, travel between villages is cut off by these floods which transform this entire landscape from a forested canopy into isolated islands. This hill tribe has evolved living root bridges that are created by guiding and growing tree roots that you can barely wrap your arms around through a carefully woven scaffolding. Multiple generations of the Khasi men and women and the children, they'll take care of these roots as they grow to the other side of that bank, where they're then planted to make a structure that will get stronger with age. This 1500 year old tradition of growing living root bridges has produced 75 of these incredible structures. And while they take 50 years to grow in this landscape, they actually last for centuries. For generations, the Khasi have dealt with environmental extremes like flooding, and they have done this by becoming more attuned to and working with nature. It shows me how resilient we could all become by learning from them. Everything you see exists together in a delicate balance. And in a previous world in time, I may have argued that this was enough to recognize that nature should be left to its own devices, that human interference ought to be minimal. But this is no longer true. Human intervention is necessary and there can be no greater manifestation of this than in combating the climate crisis. Efforts to address climate change must involve human action. We have to accept responsibility for what we're doing and not just say that nature will take care of it, because there is another great universal truth at play here. And that is that change is constant. The balance of nature has now been replaced by the flux of nature, thanks in large part due to our actions. And it is our actions that have to help restore the natural order. Our very survival depends upon it. Like many before me, my journey to save what I treasure began with losing what I loved most. My father is an avid wildlife photographer and conservationist. He is the reason my brother and I grew up so devoted to the natural world. My father instilled it in our DNA. I spent my childhood roving the jungles of India. It's where dad taught my brother and I how to fish, where I first fell in love with the call of the cheetah, where we were occasionally chased by elephants and tigers. But as I grew older, I lost these pieces of myself, as so many of us do. It was only years later when my brother passed away tragically that I was brought back to the beauty of what I loved. My brother was a fearless explorer and he lived in constant awe of the world around us. He always said our planet contains more mystery and love and beauty than the human heart can possibly hold. He is not here to teach me these lessons, but I would not have learned them without him. Even after his passing, he helped me find a way back to myself. Too often when we are faced with crises, we, will, we build walls in defense, but the human heart is not meant to be closed off. The heart is a vast, limitless land of striking contrasts, much like India. The North is strung together by the Himalayas. The South is held in a continuum of verdant forests colored by green jungles. It's this astonishing diversity that forms an indelible part of the Indian imagination. And yet, the underlying reality of our existence is that we are united, just as each peak, each range is bound to the mountain, all of it eroding together, much like the Buddhism principle of solidarity. We can transform our lives and the world around us because we have the support of others. And it was that realization that brought me to build the India Climate Collaborative, something I definitely could not have done alone. I'm here today because a lot of people came forward who took a chance in this dream. We stand on each other's shoulders and this was the spirit in which the ICC was created, a collaborative platform convening business, philanthropy and civil society for an India-led, India-focused collective response to the climate crisis. We believe climate and all of its diverse solutions actually hold answers to many of India's development challenges. Every year, the World Economic Forum puts out a report on the top five global risks to the world in terms of impact. From 2010 onwards, you will see that we have had mostly economic risks to today, where in the past five years, environmental risks have been the top three or four of the top five risks of the world. 
number one in 2020 was failure in climate action. And India has a particular reason to care about this in that we are one of the most vulnerable countries in the world to climate change. In 2018, German Watch ranked India the fifth most vulnerable country in terms of deaths and economic losses due to extreme weather events. India is spectacularly vulnerable to climate change. We have a long coastline, a rapidly growing population, and importantly, high agricultural dependence. This is where our largest vulnerability arises from, the sheer number of people in this country who are one natural disaster away from falling below the poverty line. The overall impact of climate change in a country like India is the increased likelihood of a future, much like the one we are living in today, where much of India is battling natural disasters like floods and storms and the impacts of COVID-19. This is a future where crises overlap and much of the work that we have done to progress on the SDGs will be reversed, either by dramatic natural disasters or by slow incremental degradation that makes parts of our country unlivable and affects the ones who are already most vulnerable. And this topic is specifically where the inequity and injustice of climate change lie. The countries that have contributed the least and within it, the people who have contributed the least to climate change are the ones who are impacted the most. This is a significant point about climate change in a place like India. It hurts the most vulnerable the hardest, the very communities we seek to safeguard and serve. And as always, it means an impact on women and children the most. Women in India still suffer from systemic structures that limit their ability to own land, to manage their own finances or access education, all of the things that make us more resilient to shocks. For instance, women make up more than a third of India's agricultural workforce, yet only 13% of farmland is owned by women. Air pollution is another example, which impacts women and children the most because they spend their time indoors breathing in the fumes that come from cooking fuels. India is in a unique position. Not only are we incredibly vulnerable to the impacts of climate change, we have a unique responsibility. We are the third largest emitter in the world, and as we develop, our share of emissions is only expected to go up. You see why when you see our emission sources. The majority of our emissions come from our energy supply, and this is at a time in our development where a part of our population still doesn't have access to electricity. Every sector in India tells a similar story. We will have more emissions from transportation as more individuals aspire to have more vehicles. We will have more emissions from agriculture as we have greater populations to feed. We will have more from industrial processes as India industrializes and more waste as our cities grow. The good news is that India has recognized that responsibility and has set some of the most ambitious climate commitments in the world. We have committed to a two degree world and by some counts, we have already made significant progress in meeting those goals. But these numbers can sound very detached from the reality we live in. We're already living in a one degree world. And even though this sounds bleak, it's not totally hopeless because for the most part, we have all the solutions. It's our choice to make. And we do get to choose the future we are trying to build. It's definitely not too late to halt climate change, but we do need to start now. There's a wonderful quote by President Barack Obama that I love. He says, we're the first generation to experience the impacts of climate change and the last one that can do anything about it. And the decisions India makes in the next few years will have impacts not just for us and our most marginalized communities, but for the whole world. That brings us to our solutions. Climate action has two equally important prongs. Mitigation, which involves ensuring we don't put more emissions into the atmosphere, or that we continue removing emissions from the atmosphere by restoring and protecting our forests. And adaptation, that involves investing in data and some of the research that will help protect us from the shocks we know are coming in our rapidly warming world. There is a wide perception that climate change is going to drive attention away from the things that truly matter to people on the ground, especially in developing countries. And India cannot afford that. But the reality is also that climate will not wait for us to develop. So we have to find a way to do things at the same time. We have to invest in things that produce double, triple wins. And that's the sweet spot in the middle called co-benefits, where climate and development go hand in hand. It's at times like this in the middle of a debilitating global pandemic that we realize we are advocating for the same things. We realize how unequal our development stories have been. 
good development is actually a bedrock to climate resilience. It involves all of the things we're struggling with today. We have to invest in social safety nets, investing in high quality, accessible healthcare, investing in water resilient structures, in climate resilient agriculture. In the end, they have the same goal, fewer people at risk. So when we decided to build the ICC, we focused on philanthropies because their mandate is to protect the most vulnerable populations. Organizations like the Tara Trust, which have incubated the ICC, we've been doing this since before independence. Our currency is complexity and our mandate is to change lives for the better, especially for the most vulnerable. Philanthropy has a unique role to play in climate action because it can increase ambition. It can scale, it can innovate solution and it can drive collaboration, which we think is the most important. But in India, very few philanthropies work on climate change. We created the ICC to encourage that leadership, that collaboration, because if we know one thing, it's that everybody is vulnerable, no one is protected, and everyone has a responsibility, and everyone can make a change. We have worked together to bring some of the leading philanthropic and business voices in India to the same table, to make a bold and ambitious commitment for our national response to climate change. And we do this across a wide community of actors who bring technical expertise, implementation expertise, policy and government expertise to our collective efforts. We are young, but we have a lot of hope for what the collective power of this community can do together. What we need are people across sectors, across all walks of life, embedding climate into their everyday realities, into their decisions, their choices. There is no one solution. We need more of everything and we need it really fast. So here's what you can do. Eat less meat and dairy. After fossil fuels, the food industry, and in particular, the meat and dairy sector is one of the most important contributors to climate change. If cattle were their own nation, they would be the th world's third largest emitter of greenhouse gases after China and the US. Not to mention around 30% of the world's land area is used for livestock production. It's one of the key reasons for cutting down forests. By reducing your consumption of animal protein by half, you can cut your diet's carbon footprint by more than 40%. You can green your commute. Planes run on fossil fuels and we haven't figured out a scalable alternative. A normal transatlantic round trip flight can release 1.6 tons of carbon dioxide, almost as much as the average yearly emissions of one person in India. This also highlights the inequality of climate change. While everyone will be affected, only a minority of humans fly and even fewer people take planes often. So fly less, virtual meetings, holidaying in local destinations or using trains instead of planes are all ways to cut down. Same goes for cars, walk or cycle when you can and enjoy the physical and mental health benefits as well as the money saved. Three, consume less, waste less, enjoy life more. Focusing on life simple pleasures, spending time in nature, being with loved ones, making a difference to others, provides more purpose, belonging, and happiness than buying and consuming. Plus, when we consume less, we produce fewer emissions and are gentler on the earth. Sharing, mixing, fixing, upcycling, repurposing, and composting are all good places to start. Shop differently. That's number four. And that's because everything we buy has a carbon footprint, either in the way it is produced or how it's transported. For instance, the clothing sector represents around 3% of the world's global production emissions of carbon dioxide, mostly because of the use of energy to produce attire. The hectic pace of fast fashion contributes to this figure as clothes are discarded or fall apart after short periods. This is true for food as well. Avoid groceries shipped in from other countries. The best approach is to eat food that is both locally grown and seasonal. Number five, respect and protect green spaces. Green spaces absorb carbon dioxide, cool overheated urban areas, reduce flood risks, and provide multiple benefits to public health. Plant a tree, create your own green space, and help to protect and nurture local parks, ponds, or community gardens. There are many, many more things we can do, but I think our personal carbon footprints aren't the whole picture. The really big emitters of emissions right now are big industries like the energy sector, like the industrial sector, like shipping, transport, aviation, the fact is that last year, the world emitted about 38 billion tons of carbon dioxide, mostly from burning fossil fuels for energy. So, although individual action is important, it has an effect. It's never going to be able to achieve enough on its own. Okay, so then you may ask, changing how industries are run uh, doesn't sound like anything I can influence, can I? You can. 
individuals need to exercise their rights as both citizens and as consumers, putting pressure on their governments and on companies to make the system-wide changes that are needed. For instance, find out where your money goes, voice your preferences for responsible investments, use your voice in elections. You can vote for candidates that actually support some kind of measures to combat climate change. Thinking about what's happening in our climate, if you like, is just part of being a responsible citizen. And it's becoming more important every day. Clamping down on the illegal trade of wildlife, ending deforestation, protecting intact ecosystems, educating people about the risks of consuming wildlife, changing the way we produce food, phasing our fossil fuels and transitioning to a circular economy. These are the things we can and must do, even if it's just for selfish reasons, for our own survival, now more than ever, we need the wild. I think one of the most spiritual experiences I've ever had was when I was in Rwanda and I went to see the silverback gorillas. It was a five hour hike at 9,000 feet. They were five feet from us in the midst of dense jungle that we had spent hours climbing and hacking our way through, up steep, vast rainforest on top of a volcano, and you arrive exhausted and tearful because you don't think you can take one more step before you fall down and collapse. And then lo and behold, there they are, a family of 30 primate silverback gorillas. They tower above you and suddenly you do succumb to tears that is, but it's not because of how tired you are. It's because you simply cannot believe the majestic beauty and power and grace these creatures possess. And you are miles from any form of human civilization. And that's how incredible this planet is, that this land that suffered so much tragedy and loss on such an unbearable scale can also hold and preserve and nurture life in this form, in all its glory and splendor. What a crazy world we live in. It was truly humbling and profound. I imagine that instead of exhausting our unique gifts and consuming this planet, we would realize that the greatest expression of our humanity would be in becoming its custodian, guardian, and biographer. Thank you, everyone.